There are few places on Earth that are truly a complete and utter threat to man. While yes, dangers exist at every latitude of this planet, as you move to the far south or to the far north, weather patterns become more chaotic and strong, oceans become more turbulent and frigid, and animals become larger and more aggressive. To that point, to deal with the environment, animal life must adapt in a way that they almost become reflections of the area around them. Except for penguins at the South Pole, nobody really knows what they're doing down there, or why they're hanging out with so many bloodthirsty predators, but regardless, because of this, there are many stories of man running across some of these predators and realizing we are in no way a match for them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because let's be real here, uh, carrying a 50 cal desert eagle most definitely makes you a match for pretty much anything on this planet. Humanity number one. With all these stories of men being picked up and carried off in the night by predators of the far north specifically, it's important to have at least a marginal amount of respect for the species that do inhabit these areas because you really do not want an incident that even if you were to survive, you would have to deal with the consequences of dealing with other humans, which uh, the government sure does love their fines. Hmm. Anyhow, one of the issues that we as a species will impose on these animals, however, is just our day-to-day -day lives. Look, I'm not a climatologist, but things are getting warmer around here. Is it us? Is it just a natural life cycle of the planet or the sun? More data is required, but regardless of who or what is causing it, it is getting warmer. And this will intrinsically cause changes in the behavioral patterns of animals, the big one being hunting grounds. Homo sapiens, if we are in fact causing this, will need to address it, because if we aren't, it really is just more of a scientific venture to address it. Regardless of what may be heating up this planet, the point is, animals will need to adapt and adapt quickly if they want to live and depending on how you look at it humanity may have a hand in forcing these adaptations through things like gene manipulation but the question remains should we do that our scientists were so worried about whether they could they didn't stop to think if they should and that tends to be the case in the events of unnatural, that is exactly what our hyper-intelligent species with anxiety is doing. By using our giant brains that are just smart enough to think about how to do it, but not smart enough to think about the consequences of doing it, the company would begin adapting animals in order to help them survive the coming changes to the environment. But the problem remains the same. Pig and an elephant DNA just won't splice. Creating more issues than solving, the idea seems sound, but the issues arise when you begin altering predators. So in today's episode, let's discuss the chimeric beast that just completely breaks down walls and snacks on brainstems in Unnatural. And if you enjoy this content, please leave it a like as it shows YouTube that these videos don't suck. Uh, and if you think they suck, go ahead and leave a comment because then that just drives up engagement. And if you really enjoyed the channel, feel free to subscribe. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. It's spring, which means allergies are looming and also the dread, including probably what you have. Everybody's pretty much expected to be shirtless at pools and beaches and lakes in just a few short months. So it's probably crossed your mind, huh, I should probably start eating better. If not for that reason, then for your health in general. And with that, today's sponsor is Perfect. With their fresh, never frozen meals that are chef crafted and dietitian approved, you can put these meals in the microwave for like two minutes and have a delicious meal ready to go. With 35 weekly options available with things like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, which is my personal favorite, and vegan and veggie options with around 60 add-ons, it really is a fantastic meal delivery service. A few years back, Factor actually approached me about an integration and then sent me some food and I was so impressed, I signed up for the service myself afterwards and I've been supplementing my intake of calories with their Protein Plus option. I went from like 215 pounds down to 175 now and maintained strength due to the increased protein offered in each meal. And because it was just like so easy to do, turning to factor rather than takeout, it just worked because it was so flexible. I just go to the fridge, open it, grab a meal, and boom, I just had something that had 50 grams of protein in it. Factor is also celebrating Earth Day all month long with their Earth Month Eats, a badge on the menu that shows the lowest carbon footprint options. So if you're ready to start eating healthier, then by heading to factor75.com or clicking the link below and using code Roanoke50, you can get 50% off your first box and then a another 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. We kick off our story with ice shelves falling as global laming is brought up. The guy who's totally not evil in any way is forging an eco-frontier to form a safer tomorrow. What the hell does that even mean? Well, a bunch of corporate nonsense like words like synergy or maybe your manager who pretends he's in the military and says they need boots on the ground. Bro, you're dealing with Funko Pop distribution, not missiles. So, as we get the 
title card unnatural because Supernatural was already taken and Abnatural just doesn't sound right. Flying through the mountains, everyone is practicing their hilarious poses for when they inevitably crash as they look down on the scariest of all the tundra animals, the moose. Well, polar bears are probably worse, but you get the point. As a man looks up at the plane, he is placing bear traps in the snow and then steps over it. Bold strategy. As the plane lands, Mr. Handsome Beard Man gets out of the plane and as they arrive at Black Rabbit Lodge, they meet Martin as the young woman asks for the Wi-Fi. They start complaining about the cold and the only thing I know about cold in Alaska is the old man told me this uh, when he was stationed up there. They flew from, I think it was Miami in February. They stopped to refuel, but they kept the plane closed and they stayed inside of it. And then landing in Alaska, apparently they opened up the doors. The old man stepped off the plane and fell back into his sergeant because the air was so frigid and it was such a shock it instantly froze his inner nostrils. Classic dad. So it's warm inside, allegedly. 40 degrees max in that lodge. Heading inside, it's a cabin, all right. The wall over there was built by General Custard in 1876. There's a bunch of bones everywhere, and the sun comes up at 10 a.m. and it goes down at 2 p.m. But in between, it's basically just dusk. While that's going on, a woman at the research facility looks at blood cells, or what I thought were blood cells, but they're actually beta cells under a microscope, and she seems pensive as she records that said beta cells are 600% larger than last week. Ah yes, giant cells, very good. Also, the largest single cell in the world is actually an ostrich egg. Now you know. As she looks at the monitor, a freaking bear enters the lab. What? Alrighty then, I mean it is Alaska, so I'm sure much stranger things have happened. So she calls out to Dr. Keller to tell them to stay out of NP2, which is exactly where they're going, of course. So they enter the room as alarms start going off and a bear starts roaring. The scientists are then ripped apart. Ah, uh, reminds me of my days in the lab. Same amount of bloodlust too. And speaking of blood, it starts spilling out underneath the door as the bear starts trying to break in through that door. Bro, that is a determined animal. Meanwhile, back over at Lover's Lodge, Burnett over here starts hitting on Photography Nerd, who's not even paying attention. Classic. Blondie starts popping pillies, as one does at 3 p.m. in Alaska. So this dude is like yelling like a madman at his, these, like his offspring? No, these aren't his offspring. I haven't figured out the relationship yet. So they sit down for dinner that night as they talk with a photographer talking about draping the women in furs. Uh, Okay, they're models. Otherwise, this movie needs to be investigated. Basically, this dude is a turbo douche, and that's his whole thing. Mr. Booking is definitely getting got in this movie at some point. The owner says that they had to actually put the bear behind him down, and then they taxidermied it. Uh, did he do it himself? Nope, Chuck Testa. That's right, it's an old meme, sir, but it still checks out. He begins talking about Maneater as a bear out there, and that's the name that they gave it. It arose from the white man's encroachment on the area, and it stands over 20 feet tall. So the one man who hasn't spoken, Nate, starts disassociating and talking about revenge as one does. Maneater is nature's way of fighting back. And fun fact, for some reason in the US, this movie is called Unnatural, but everywhere else, the movie is called Maneater. Why they thought we couldn't handle the word Maneater is beyond me. Also, I'm not sure if you've actually ever seen a polar bear standing up. The largest one ever taken out was around 12 feet tall or around 4 meters. From the perspective of you looking at this thing, yeah, you might think it's 20 feet tall as well. Polar bears are absolutely horrifying animals. Sitting there, the lights begin to flicker as the polar bears are affecting the electricity as Martin then heads outside to gas at the generator. Meanwhile, back at Nerd Outpost, Hannah is breathing heavily trying to escape the hungry bear that knows how to crash through doors. She can hear it in the distance, rustling, menacingly. Hearing biting and crunching, one guy gets totally got as he's just completely dragged off screen. So she makes a break for it, opening a supply cabinet and running for a vehicle. Getting it started? It actually starts, which I'm very surprised. Usually it's like, oh no, I can't get it started. And then the bear like unlocks the door. So she escapes the bear, leaving it behind. Back at the cabin, the models are scared because the photographer starts kind of like bringing up the story about the bear as Ella is then like flirting with him and he's hitting on her, as one does. Also, uh, do you think like this whole scene was awkward to film? Probably. So as we're getting frisky, something is watching from outside. Again, awkward to film? Definitely. But something continues to creep by watching them from the giant open window that they could have easily just shut the curtains uh, as they continue to do what humans do for a third time. Do you think this is awkward? It then thuds on the window as Mr. Photographer goes and looks outside but sees nothing. I can't just close the curtains. Meanwhile, the truck has been driving through the afternoon as she tries to text and drive but crashes. And that pretty much tracks. Don't text and drive. She gets knocked out after hitting an embankment as we jump over to the models freezing outside the next day. We now meet one man, Buff, working on a radio in a shed and that's the life I want to live. They talk about the satellite phones on the roof and they also talk about an ice storm coming in. This ice storm will never make its debut. They just kind of set it. Like, why do they even bring it up? So as he calls out on the radio, yep, it's still broken. The scientist woman from earlier has woken back up as she begins making her trek. Wait, bear trap! 
but not yet. Over at the lake, the man starts drilling for like an ice fishing shot and the photographer starts yelling at him about it. Like, bro, these are, these are pictures, not video. They won't show up on film. One of the models though has to go pee, so she's got to walk into the tree line to do it. It do be that way or just pee behind everyone, though the wind might cause some issues. Okay, so as she does it, bro, the shots in this movie are insane. She went so deep into the woods, like this is a Narnia situation. She hears sticks breaking and growling, as in she falls next to a munched on wolf and freaks out. Nate being the alpha chad that he is, pulls out man's answers to everything, and then runs over, finding her freaking out. It's a dead animal. Calm down there, gals. Just a three-fourths eaten wolf. The man then looks around and then feels the wolf and it's still warm, which is not a good sign. Back over at the cabin, they are cooking dinner for the evening as Martin tastes it and says, hey, this is pretty good. Mainly because the cook was like, no, it tastes like crap. Remember, this is some advice from Papa Roanoke. Always compliment the cook. It took effort to do that. Appreciate the effort, even if it tastes terrible. So as Nate looks out, uh, the photographer begins yelling at him that they need to get these pictures done. Like, why is why is he yelling at Nate? So uh, then they take pictures as Mr. Photographer starts freaking out about the light not being right. Dude, there is so much light reflecting off the snow, it does not matter. But the brunette model then asks the blonde model what happened. She says she saw a dead animal and freaked out as she takes off her dead animal hat. The irony. Blondie then tells Booking it was a stupid idea to be here, they should be out on a beach. How long does a photo shoot actually take? They've been out there for quite some time. Nate then breaks through the ice, finally, as they are doing the ice fishing shot. And you would not believe saying that three times fast is actually a little difficult. But it's also golden hour now. The photographer then tells Nate he's not beautiful and to get out of the way. Beauty is in the soul, brother. So uh, he starts taking pictures with the sun in the background. Like, those are going to look terrible. At least I think they will. Nate then hears a bear growling as the ice begins to crack. Now that's not a good sign. Nate then tells them not to move as, yo, Burnett just gets straight pulled under the ice. What? So the photographer then makes a heroic escape as Nate approaches the ice hole. Bro, stay away from that ice hole. No thanks. Nate then fires some shots and yells as the camera cuts away from him. The photographer continues to leave the scene of the crime and then head back to the cabin, completely not caring about anyone else. Standard. So they stop like four miles away from the cabin and instead just kind of run up to it instead of just, you know, snowmobiling up to it. Martin then asks what happened as he heads outside. Martin tells Booking to stay inside with the girls and act like a man as he heads back to the ice hole, leaving the other ice holes behind. Finding nobody nearby, he looks down and sees there's a lot of blood on the snow and ice. As he does, he hears rustling in the distance. He looks around, seeing bubbles coming up from the water, and it's just Burnett's head and collarbones coming up, but that's about it. Bummer. So... First and foremost, what's the deal here? As shown by the paw that came up out of the water, we see white fur and obvious bear claws. This, however, is not going to be your standard bear, but we'll get to that much later when we get to like the genetic splicing. For the most part, however, foundationally, this is a bear and will behave as such, specifically a polar bear. So why are polar bears absolutely horrifying? I'm glad you asked. And to understand that, let's start with a story, shall we? There was an expedition in the 1800s, I believe up to find the North Pole. I may be a little hazy on the details, but the story itself is the same. A group of men went up there trying to find it and were seemingly not prepared as they thought they were. Humanity has known about black bears and grizzly bears, but very few of our species had ever heard about the existence of a polar bear. As they went out there, they were armed with muskets. One night, they would actually notice an absolutely massive white bear was following them. Keeping its distance, eventually their camp was attacked later on. The men were like, they already had their muskets loaded and they took shots at this thing, all of which did absolutely nothing to the bear. It picked up one of the men by his torso like a dog does to a puppy and just walked off a few hundred yards and they could hear the man screaming the whole time. They had to sit there and listen to this guy being eaten alive until he finally stopped screaming. This apparently went on for several nights and they were never able to actually bring this thing down. Obviously, some men survived as the tale was told, but this just shows the absolute ridiculous size, strength, and just durability that these creatures have. Basically, unless you're packing some serious heat, this thing will absolutely body you in moments and there's not really much you can do about it. Like, even with other bears, if you had an axe or something, you could go at its head. You're not going to do much, but it might feel like you're doing much. But with a polar bear, yeah, good luck. Polar bears, because of their environment, are absolute powerhouses, and a lone or even group of unarmed humans, or maybe even armed with older tech, are absolutely no match for these things. You just cannot cause enough damage to get it to go away. They tend to hunt by finding and attacking seals, and they crack through several inches of ice in order to do so. They can also swim vast distances, and as of late, one was spotted holding its breath, diving under the water for three minutes to hunt. They really are an almost completely unmatched beast. Personally, I'd like to see one like fighting an orca? I think that would be pretty cool. But standing typically at 10 feet tall, as mentioned, some have been seen up to 12 feet tall. 
They can also weigh over a literal ton, with the largest one being 2,210 pounds or 1,002.44 kilograms. Not only that, but these animals are not like any other bears. There's a phrase used that's actually kind of pertinent to this situation. If it's black, fight back. If it's brown, lie down. If it's white, good night. Because the frozen wasteland that it lives in is not going to be as plentifully stocked with food. Anything that moves is food to it, including you. If it catches your scent or sees you, it is officially hunting you and will follow you for tens if not hundreds of miles to achieve its meal. So as he searches the tree line for Nate, he finds his handheld, but that's about it. Heading further back, he finds blood on the snow and then drag marks. He turns and then finds Mrs. Scientist from earlier. Carrying her out of there towards the snowmobile, he hears howling of the wolves in the distance, but are they actually wolves? We'll discuss soon. Back over at the cabin, everyone is not really appearing to mourn their co-worker. I guess it happens. The photographer then starts talking about a lawsuit. To be honest with you, bro, it's nature. That would be like suing a hurricane for destroying your house. Bringing in the scientists, they start getting her warmed up. As Lily asks where Nate is, Martin tells her something got Nate. Booking asks what's out there, but Martin really doesn't know. Dr. Linval, by the way, or Hannah as she's known, is sitting there. They cover up with a blanket, which, why? Like, no bro, just put her next to the fire. Lily then latches on to the good doctor to keep her warm, but you know what put off more heat? A fire. So Blonde Model starts crying about the brunette model, finally somebody's morning, as they talk about what it may have been. Ice bear, probably. Blonde Model then starts leaking out of her nose. That was gross. Booking then tells her, don't worry, I'm here. Nothing will get you. Yeah, gal, you're totally safe now. Booking then tells the old man about Nate and his girlfriend. Way to break the news. He says that there were tracks that he's never seen before, and Martin tells them that they're staying there tonight. As Buff heads out, he says he's gonna go make a call on the radio. The, uh, the broken radio? That one? Also, the scientist is back up and away. Why the broken radio? You know it's broken. So, Buff begins his 3 p.m. walk back to the shed in total darkness. That sucks. As he hears twigs breaking... Ruh -ruh raggy. He then hears growling as the bear is now chasing him. Don't think a shed is going to help out this situation. He ends up dropping his stuff and then running before tripping as it goes after the rabbit, of, like, or at least whatever he dropped, as then he heads inside the house and grabs the old force multiplier, getting that baby locked and loaded brides of Christ. As he gets the radio on, he calls out to Shelly about an emergency, but the radio is broken. It's not repaired, my guy. The bear then is now outside of the cabin as it starts trying to get through the walls. As he looks out the window, he sees it as it then breaks through like a fat kid breaks through a Twix candy bar wrapper and bites Buff as we hear squelching. Tasty. So now we have seen this abomination, we can see it most definitely on the larger side of what polar bears should be, but it's also appearing to be beyond that. While polar bears are highly intelligent, they will typically not just break through doors and walls to get to food, but they could. However, I think I have an idea as to why this creature may be as aggressive as it is. So let's go back to the beginning when the good doctor was discussing the cells that she was looking at in her recording. She mentions the specific cell being the beta cell. Now it could just be like they were referring to a beta cell as like a hybridized animal cell, but I doubt it. For reasons unknown, the beta cells specifically are roughly 600% larger than they should be. But what is a beta cell? I'm glad you asked. Beta cells are integral to how our bodies operate. These cells specifically with Homo sapiens are found within the pancreas within clusters of cells known as islets. These cells produce insulin, which is the hormone that controls the level of glucose in your blood. The body will detect glucose levels with the pancreas, obviously, in the islets of Langerhans. That's pretty much where it's called, or what it's called. Again, this is where beta and alpha cells are located. But anyhow, these cells are over 600% larger than they should be, and this would absolutely be releasing way too much insulin into the bloodstream which is a two-pronged issue. Well, maybe not an issue, sort of, but it would have cascading effects that would create issues. The first is, that depending on how long this has been happening, this would result in a much larger animal due to the constant desire to eat. The brain would not know to switch off the hunger signals because blood glucose would always be extremely low for this creature. And this would make it absolutely ravenous, which as we have seen, it is hunting and eating everything on sight and doesn't really seem to ever reach a point of satiation. This would ultimately, however, result in the animal becoming obese, but still feeling starving at the same time, and this would further make it aggressive as to it just, it's gonna feel like it's constantly dying. The nutrition it does take in during a period of growth, though, would make the creature larger than what would be considered normal for its species, though it is a different species altogether, and we will get there. Eventually, however, this would lead to insulin insensitivity, or at least resistance for cells, as they are absolutely flooded with insulin all the time created by the larger beta cells. This over time could lead to blood sugar reaching dangerously high levels, resulting in organ damage and eventually a diabetic coma. However, for the time being, what you have 
is a massive apex predator that thinks it's starving, inducing increased aggression that can break through walls. So, back at the cabin, Lily then drops off some clothes for the doctor, who's drinking tea, having been thoroughly revived. In the bathroom, Booking comes to check on Blonde Model, as the girlfriend slot has just opened up, as then he finds her pills. He tells her to be careful as Lily approaches Martin in the kitchen. She asks if a bear did this to Nate, as Martin says he's not sure. So, they have a nice cry over it, as Martin is shook, and Lily is not doing so hot either. Martin has questions that he needs answers, and he thinks the scientist lady has those answers. So, the plan is Martin will head up on the ridge the next day and make a call at daybreak to get the plane to actually come pick them up early. The doctor then chimes in saying polar bears do not hibernate because it's cold all the time. Martin has her badge as he throws it on the table and says the company is tampering with the environment. Well, tampering with the environment, I guess, the animals. And it's Clobert or whatever they are. The totally normal, not evil guy from earlier. Martin says they are too far south for polar bears and that it's really just told that, well, they're migrating south for food. The doctor is working on, <laughs> is working for the piss take umbrella, claims that uh, they came across a rogue polar bear as an attack the scientists, which uh, those are the easiest form of human to take out. They're like newborns, I suppose. Soft hands from being in the lab too long. So I guess nobody is really ready to go to bed because of the adrenaline, the fact that it's only 5.38 p.m. as Blonde Model then takes a bunch of pills to go to sleep Sleep until the plane comes tomorrow. Probably a good idea. Operation cannot possibly go wrong engaged. Martin then goes to check on Buff as he hasn't heard anything as he tells Lily to keep an eye on the doctor because she's a liar. Agreed. Heading off into bear infested woods, specifically chimeric polar bear infested woods, he finds the trapped animal Buff had on the ground. Picking up the pace, he calls out for Buff and then heads inside finding evidence of the attack and a broken wall. He then hears growling in the distance. Polar bear growling. Back at the cabin, the doctor then sneaks up on Lily as she came down to get a glass of water, uh, freaking her out. The doctor then grabs her badge to remove the fact that she was ever even there. The doctor then starts asking where Martin is, and he's in polar bear infested woods, of course. So as he looks out, we see the bear is snacking on its manwich. Turning on the flashlight, it activates the polar bear's almonds as he drops the flashlight and then runs back to the cabin. Which is a little strange because this thing does not actually chase him. It stops in the tree line and also Martin like mentioned an arsenal earlier about, oh, I'll just get my arsenal together and go up on the ridge line. Where's the arsenal, Martin? Might need that sooner rather than later. Heading inside, Lily then hands him a drink because it's a lot like Dead Space 3 where, you know, you have a suit meant to deal with the frigid temperatures of space, yet somehow landing on Tal Volantis, your body temperature drops. And if you say it's because your helmet is broken, you're a nerd. But you're also probably right. I imagine the helmets regulated the suit temperature, and without it, it just sort of turns off, allowing the suit to just bleed heat more rapidly, leading to Isaac and Carver to deal with the temperature exposure because their heads are completely exposed. Wait a minute, we're talking about polar bears. Let's go back to that. Okay, so Lily asks if Buff is gone. Yes, so is Nate, also brunette model. She asks if they're next. Only if you don't fight back with this alleged arsenal. Martin says he's going to go lead this thing away, but they need to stay inside. Bro, this thing is tearing down walls. Inside's not going to help. Get the arsenal ready now. Martin says he's going to be fine. <laughs> you don't know that. Because honestly, those are some famous last words. So Booking is looking, that rhymed, through some photos of Burnett model as he starts having flashbacks. PTSD wrecking face. So he has a nice cry knowing he didn't really do anything, but... Really? You never know how you're going to handle a situation like that, so we cannot really blame him too harshly. So the next day, Martin gets loaded up with his arsenal, small rounds, and just th the same rifle he's had the whole time. Hardly an arsenal. He then gets back on the snowmobile and fires it up as the doctor watches. Definitely not going to be a problem. He then heads back out to the ice hole as he approaches the tree line. Booking then talks to the doctor about how the last photo he got was of the brunette model getting dragged under the ice. Back over at Murder Bear Ridge, Martin tries to get a signal on the satellite phone, which I really don't get. It's a satellite phone, like satellites overhead. I mean, maybe getting higher up might help, but the mountains shouldn't block the signal. I don't know how satellite phones work. So as he walks deeper in the woods, where's the bear trap? Everyone at the cabin looks really bored at this point. So the doctor just kind of, you know, make a conversation, asks if Martin was probably making a call by now, as Lily asks how her team even got out there. She asks the doctor, like, where did you guys stay? We're the only cabin for 100 miles. And she's like, oh, there's a research camp for wildlife preservation and definitely not making chimeric monsters. Also, is Booking wearing Uggs? That completely tracks. So as Martin keeps walking, eventually he finds the truck the doctor crashed. Getting inside, he finds the tape recorder as seemingly they added wolf DNA to something. We know what they added. Looks like they got a real fun house around here. 
Subject beta, which they talk about beta cells and they call it subject beta, or maybe just its cells in general were 600% larger, though I kind of doubt it. It gained a number of traits as Martin realizes they are growing these things. So the doctor then sneaks off to go blow up the bathroom or something. Never mind, she's actually going to raid Booking's camera, but gets caught. She tries to lie, but scientists are not really good at lying, so she appeals to his ego, which always works. She says she's trying to help, as he tells her, no thanks, I don't want your help. <laughs> okay, whatever. So Martin continues walking through Narnia as the sun is getting lower in the sky, and it was already pretty low when it rose. The bear is also watching him, and as it starts coming after him, it starts shaking every tree possible along the- Oh god, where's the bear trap? Martin continues running through the buried bear trap country. It's gonna happen, I think. No, it's not. It's just kidding. Uh, they're just gonna take a pot shot. They're really blue-balling us with these bear traps. So Booking says, the thing already ate Martin. He's calling it. Martin says the thing is no polar bear to himself as he takes off in the snowmobile, but then gets bear swiped on the side. Not sure how he lost track of the bear, but okay. Ouchies. So we've all run the simulations. They're tough, but they ain't invincible. As we look at this thing, it's definitely not a bear. The face is completely wrong. Martin then ditches the snowmobile for some reason. Like, bro, if you can, get back on that thing. It can definitely smell you bleeding, and as he looks back, he spots it really just kind of stalking him. He decides to just leave a nice blood trail instead, as where's the bear trap? Leaving as much scent as possible everywhere, he starts running out of juice. Blood loss will do that to you. Adrenaline can only take you so far. He then falls down exhausted as the thing howl growls in the distance, and Booking says they're safe in the cabin, as the doctor says, no we're not. The power then starts going out, because the polar bears are affecting the electricity, naturally. The doctor then says she will go fill the generator. As night falls, somehow Martin isn't food yet, and what in the gray is happening here? He then covers himself in branches, and I think it can probably still smell you, bro, but an attempt is made nonetheless as his flesh continues to squelch. Tasty. Booking, realizing it's five o'clock somewhere, starts getting drunk as the generator finally goes out. It wasn't the doctor, like, she put on her coat a while ago to go refuel this thing. So, uh, then the ladies head outside as Booking stays inside. He talks about how he's the last man standing, being a little generous with that statement, bro. So the generator, for some reason, is, like, super far away from the house. I imagine it's because it's cold and they didn't want to hear it. But then they hear objects clattering as Booking is actually going to do something, so he grabs the fire poker. Seeing the bear outside, he says, it's here. They then head into the kitchen as Booking says he's going to teach a polar bear a lesson with a fire poker. Yeah, good luck with that. Liquid courage flowing nicely. That's actually what happens. Uh, in World of Warcraft, it lowers the levels of the enemies that you fight if your character is drunk, if you didn't know. Just like real life. You could totally take that six foot three dude at the end of the bar to fight. No problem, bro. So as he opens the door, the two women then run in as the bear starts attacking the door. As the door creaks, it then finally breaks as the bear comes running in. It knocks down Lily as this becomes a shoot scenario as Pilly Popper comes down the stairs as Booking runs once more. The doctor smacks the bear as it latches onto Lily's foot and then drags her away to her doom and she's eaten squelching style. Man, this thing is really hungry. Well, now we know why it's hungry based on the explanation of the beta cells. Booking then tells Delena that it's going to eat her as the doctor hides in the kitchen, electing to barricade herself in. As she does, though, the creature enters the room and sniffs around looking for her, but the whole room has got to smell like blood at this point. Booking tells everyone that they need to go and run, but then as Delena turns to run, her brainstem gets ripped out by the bear. How did she not see that thing? Heading into the garage, though, they find a truck. It's old and it's cold. Actually, it's a Ford. Yo, now there is obviously some discrepancy that uh, you might be tempted to think that this is simply a 1970 F100 Ranger. You would be wrong. You see, if you look at the amount of lug nuts on this truck, these are actually going to have eight per wheel. And this indicates that it's actually a 1970 Ford F-250 Ranger. The F-250 of this era came with either a 360 engine or a 390, both of which were V8s. And because of this, the horsepower ranged from about 215 to 255, which is more than enough for what you needed. But here's the thing, though. Some of these trucks were 4x4, but it was fairly common as well to just have them as rear-wheel drive. After all, you were supposed to be towing, so sending power to the back was the absolute move. Basically, these and Chevy square bodies from the 70s are just absolutely goaded trucks. If I wasn't so invested in Toyota supremacy with my third-gen shitbox 4Runner, I would be scoping one of these immediately. So the doctor now uses this chance to get out of there, but immediately makes as much noise as possible, alerting the bear that she's in there. It then looks for her, but they finally get the truck started as Booking goes to open the garage door before heading back to the truck and getting out of there. Driving like a complete idiot. Bro, you've already done it. Just chill. You're in the truck. Well, he doesn't. So he crashes like 100 feet down the driveway. Nice job. Also, I still want to believe it has 4x4. But as they keep screwing with everything, the horn turns on and gets stuck, alerting everything around them. 
That is just classic car behavior. Looking out, I don't know if that's the same bear or another one. Are there packs of bears? Or is this just a teleporting bear? I'm not sure. So Booking says he's going to try to get back to the garage as he's able to get the truck started again, but they still can't get out of there because you should engage the four-wheel drive. I mean, surely it's a truck in Alaska. Who goes with a two-wheel drive in Alaska? They lose sight of the creature now as it immediately then jumps onto the truck, trying to break through the windshield, which in fact it does as it goes after Blonde Model taking her out. But the pills probably helped her not feel any of that. Booking then lights a lighter and puts it in the gas tank, blowing it up along with himself. Ouchies. So the doctor watched all of this and then goes to check out to see if anyone's alive and finish the job. The bear is still alive after all that, and I mean, I don't know how thick its skull is, but uh, surely what you're holding could probably do something. So she elects to run into the woods at night, very good, and as she turns around, she's like surprised the thing is on her tail. But as she keeps running, oh yeah, bear trap baby, she's now totally stuck. Which, uh, that's gotta be a terrifying feeling. Using the force multiplier as a leverage enhancer, she drops it and then limps off. Take it with you. Like, that way if it at least bites you, you can take yourself out so you don't, I don't know. Maybe a little bit pessimistic. So, uh, we do not acknowledge her as the rank of scientists. That was a really dumb move. As it approaches her, well, this thing is quite large. And as it comes up to her, it roars, but like, psych. Martin then shows up with a face mincer 9000, yelling, add this to your DNA. Like a giga chat, he spears the thing, taking it out, saving the scientists in the process. Martin is also not doing so hot. He's lost a lot of blood and just reopened that wound. He then tells her to stop doing what she's doing, as he says, it's unnatural. Oh, <laughs> they said it. She says, she knows, as he then plays the recording of her basically telling everything what was happening. I mean, okay. I mean, it is his dying wish, but bills don't get paid by dying wishes. So she has a nice cry over it as everyone is gone. And is that Aurora Borealis over this part of the country this time of year? It actually makes sense, so it's not as funny. So now we get the whole infomercial about recent setbacks and coal birch industries adapting wildlife as they preserve natural life. Adapting animals to climate change? Yes. Humanity adapting animals to climate change? What could possibly go wrong? And thus concludes unnatural. So to round out this abomination, what exactly is this creature and how did it get as large as it did? First and foremost, while Piss Taker Umbrella claims to be altering the animals in a way that was conducive to surviving the coming environmental changes, it may seem like they really aren't, but is that correct? Actually what they're doing could be pretty beneficial. First, wolves and bears are distantly related. Because of this, this could allow for compatibility of some genes within the wolf to be applied to polar bears. By natural compulsion, polar bears typically stay within the more frigid areas until the bitter end. The issue with that statement is, in and of itself, the bitter end. Polar bears, being driven by starvation, may stumble into other areas, but due to their solitary nature, except for when mating or raising cubs, it's highly unlikely that they would come across another polar bear who did the exact same thing they just did. It's entirely possible that a polar bear could be near another polar bear in terms of hunting areas, and if one polar bear is not having issues with hunting, it would never really come into contact with the other that was, thus decreasing the chances at mating and leading to extinction. By adding in wolf genes, the desire may have been to make them more social, which would allow for a greater number or even the ability to increase their hunting range that the polar bears basically would be mentally inclined to go after. While not exactly great for humanity, this would in turn push the polar bears out of their habitat and with it, allow them to survive the changing environment. Why wouldn't they just use like a brown bear given that those can interbreed is beyond me. The issue became though, how many genes came from a wolf? By very likely using CRISPR methods in the Cas9 protein complex, they could insert genes into the genetic coding of a gestating cub. By doing so, the body of the polar bear shows these changes that would have to form during the differentiation process in its formation, which again, would be during its gestation. The face is wider than normal considering a polar bear's, and the snout is more stubby and possesses longer hair and almost like a mane-like appearance, which seems to be inspired by wolf DNA. The face also appears flatter somewhat with the eyes located further over the snout rather than their usual position which would appear on polar bears. The way the creature moves also appears to be a perfect combination of wolf and bear, making it almost seemingly ungainly because it's not moving like what we would expect an animal that large to move. This has clearly caused the paws to form differently because nobody could identify the tracks that it was leaving behind. Several times we actually hear howling as well as growling, showing that potentially more DNA than just a few genes were used in order to create this thing. We can then assume that while the polar bear itself will hunt humans, this is also why it may be caught up 
on human activity. Now, typically wolves will actually avoid humans unless habituated towards us, which that is the point. They won't leave us alone, and this can result in some pretty bad interactions for both sides of the species. Also, bears are known to habituate to humans too, which is not great. So this were or both clearly was created by the scientists indicating that it was habituated to humanity. So the problem would arise in two different ways. Again, the beta cells, unless it's subject beta, but I, I tend to believe that because it was so aggressive, it would have to be experiencing starvation. So I think it was beta cells in the pancreas were overproducing insulin, causing it to become ravenously hungry, which in turn, its familiarity with humans caused it to begin hunting man almost exclusively unless other animals presented themselves. The second issue is this created a larger than average animal as what happened Happen sometimes when you combine two different animals. As made mention in my Piranaconda episode, which that was just a completely cracked out video in of itself, when two animals come together like a lion and a tiger, this can create an absolutely massive animal larger than both parents known as a liger. And this is what I believe happened to this creature as well. The combination of wolf DNA with the already absolute powerhouse foundation of the polar bear caused this thing to be much larger and still exhibit some traits that are clearly inspired by the wolf genome. But let's be real about this though. This is for fun. Sometimes in science, when you're tasked with something, you begin working to understand the process, and once you do, it really comes with the turf to just be naturally curious, that's why you're a scientist to begin with. Clearly, this research outpost started having drinks around 4 p.m. one day and thought to themselves, I mean, sure, we're altering small areas of a genome to increase polar bear sociability, so like 0.001% of a wolf genome is added, but what happens if we added 25% wolf genome? On all levels except physical, the polar bear is 25% wolf. The issue is, these things keep growing, and you basically just made a polar bear who has a taste for hoof flesh, and can now move its standard hunting area well south of where it would normally be. Operation cannot possibly go wrong a second time engaged. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. Uh, what do you think they hope to accomplish by mixing wolf genomes with literal polar bear genomes? Let me know down in the comments. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link, where last week we talked about the Dorothy Quarry disaster. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer, as well as our scientists, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-grade Horror Movies, Dakota 23, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. And to the rest of my patrons, I appreciate you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running, so thank you. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.